Welcome to Author News Weekly, the weekly news show by authors for authors. We read the news so you don't have to. Join our panel of best selling authors each week as we take a deep dive into the publishing world, both indie and traditional. Author News Weekly. Yeah, whatever. So the reason why I used all that hot air to introduce us as authors is to let you, the listener, know that we are in the author world and we live it. The topics that we discuss are relevant to us and we hope they are relevant to you as well. So we are going to get started. I think it works. I think it works. (laughs) That is our banging breaking news jingle. (laughs) And since we do this bad boy once a week, it's always breaking news. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to talk you guys about uh, is the uh, Audible return beef, right? <laughs> so you guys know that for a while, Audible has been uh, not only allowing, but encouraging returns on books that people have purchased and in some cases listened to entirely. Uh, obviously, this hasn't set well with indies uh, who take on a pretty significant burden to get these books produced and into the world. Uh, in the show notes, I'll Put a link. Well, I say me, but Nick's the the tech the tech behind this. So Nick will put a link uh, to a petition that the Authors Guild put out, uh, trying to get Audible to cut the crap and uh, allow returns for only forty eight hours, which is in line with Amazon's other practices. Audible apparently heard and they responded, and this is an excerpt of the email that they sent. Uh, we've been working to address quote. We've been working to address some ACX authors' concerns about Audible's overall exchange policy, right? Audible can and does limit the number of exchanges and refunds allowed by a member. Uh, But as designed, this customer benefit allows the Audible members in good standing to take a chance on new content. However, in recognition of these concerns and moving forward as effective, January 1st, Audible will pay royalties for any title that has been returned after seven days. So my question is, and I'll ask, I'll ask Jim first. Jim, does this make you happy or is this just lip service from Audible? Well, what's interesting is I think that the the Audible's response came so fast after authors started complaining about it. I can't believe that it was a direct response to it. You to think that they probably have been aware of that problem or aware that people are unhappy about it for a while because I don't. I just don't believe that Amazon could have respond or Audible could have responded within a week like they did. That it that it's probably been they probably knew it was a problem for a while and were looking for something to do to change it. Mm. I dig it. I dig it. All right. And so, uh, what about you, uh, Pippa? Do you uh, how do you feel about this? You think this is good, or 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 do you think this is uh, what do you think this means for for authors? Well, what's weird to me about it is the people talking about um, they would finish an audiobook and before they even reviewed it. So it, it was clear that it wasn't in response to a bad review. They would immediately get the prompt, do you want to exchange this book? And so the fact that it had worked its way through their programming and multiple dev teams is really interesting to me, especially with them responding so quickly. And that is part of what sits so poorly about the whole experience is that it was very clearly purposeful that they were hoping to do these exchanges and at at the very best way you can interpret it is at the expense of the author or the publishing house. Um, And um, that's, that's the most charitable I can be. So the The change is fine. I mean, obviously, you still want people to be able to return books that, you know, maybe they didn't get to for a week. They listened to part of and were like, oh, God, this is not for me. Like, that's fine. That's perfectly fine with me. Um, But so I like that they're making a change. Um, But I'm still a little annoyed that it happened the way it did. That it was so clearly something that had happened on purpose. Yeah. The thing that's strange to me is we... We had no idea how many returns we were dealing with anyway, <laughs> because the reporting sucks. And um, if there hadn't been that glitch, right? you know, how long would it have been until we figured it out? Yeah, well, and it, you know, we know exactly how long it's been since the reporting has sucked. Uh, since however long <laughs> ACX and Audible has been there is the answer. And ever, yeah, for Amazon ever is the answer, right? And so that's yes. that's the part that really grinds my gears about it. Is like 
we're not, I mean, I guess we're literally asking for the return thing to change as indie authors, but really what we're asking for as indie authors is just a little more transparency. You know, it's not that hard. Yeah. I mean, I can code something tomorrow yeah. that shows you how many returns come in, but why is this hard to do? It, it's got to be, the, and, I'm, and I don't want to be a, conspir- a conspiratory as the list. Conspiracy is. Man, you can conspiracy all you want here. This is a safe place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it just, I just feel like it's on purpose. Like they're vaguely, I mean, they're, they're, they're purposely being um, vague and opaque, right? Um, otherwise, that happened right, for a while. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for instance, the data that would arguably help authors produce better books at, and downstream implications about, you know, when Kindle books are stop being read, what's the page number? But they stop being read. Which ones do they not push? You know, that would help authors um, and help authors create books that would better serve readers. Um, so there's been a lot of them hiding data that they have or not passing it through. Um, and they've been very wary of that for a long time in a lot of ways. Okay. And now just to take your guys' temperature, uh, are you guys all uh, – Wide with your audiobooks? Are you audible only with your audiobooks? What 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 about uh what about you guys? I am wide. Um I didn't want to do the five year exclusive. So I went through Find Away. Yeah, right on. Well, it's like is it seven years, isn't it? Oh god. Yeah, yeah. it's even worse. It's even worse. <laughs> you were good. You were you were you were on tar- you were on target because it's even worse than that. Uh Jim, Jim, what do you got? How are you uh, doing? My audiobooks are presently Audible exclusive because I had no idea what I was doing in like 2015 and 2016. I made every possible audiobook mistake you can imagine making. Um, you know, I did royalty share. I did different narrators for books in a series. I literally did, a fart in the middle of it. Yeah, just nothing but one book was nothing but farts, and that one not, <laughs> it's my best reviewed book. I was going to say, not, ironically, <laughs> people like that the most. <laughs> But no, I mean, that's the narrator had to try to dictate that, (laughs) (laughs) that that's, that's the main reason why I haven't put anything into audio in the last couple of years, because now I understand the consequences of entering into a seven year exclusive agreement with audible. And I'm going to think much, much harder before I do something like that again. Although I believe that is part of their apology this time is you can withdraw your books from the exclusive contract. Really? Yes. I believe that was part of the letter was that you oh, could okay. get out of your exclusivity contract if you were pissed enough. Well, interesting. Hmm. Interesting. We I, have the, I think you're very pissed about that, Jim. I breaking very, news. <laughs> I think you're very pissed. Huh. Okay, yeah, good deal. Because my mm-hmm. answer is I'm exclusive for mm-hmm. the same reasons uh, that Jim mentioned, mainly the farts in the middle of the book. Um, <laughs> but uh, mm-hmm. I, I didn't know what I was doing, and I wanted it to get done, and I didn't have any money. I, my books weren't making any money in any format. Mm -hmm. Um, because I only had one of them and no one had ever heard of it. And so I did the 50, 50 royalty split. Um, and ironically enough, um, a couple months ago this year is the, is when that seven year contract expired, um, for that first book. And so I now own that recorded narration. Um, Mike, my narrator, good friend of mine has been paid in full and you know, we're amicable. It was an amicable split, but now I own this audio book, um, that I can do with what I please. Uh, and I've got some cool ideas for it, but that's not you know the scope of this discussion. So going yeah. forward, yeah, I don't have any intention or interest in locking myself into an arrangement unless the deal is really sweet. Um, I'd rather just pay up front. Yeah, right on. And that's actually what I did with mine. I, I just paid to have them done uh, per finished hour, put them out through Find A Way. And uh, they're out into the world where magically uh, the library, uh, people download, borrow my ebooks or my audiobooks from the library. Uh, which is pretty cool, and it's actually a segue into uh, my next topic. All right, if you guys see how I did that, that's pretty. Sick. I do. I like that. Uh-huh. Do we need to not, like a segue uh, audio or something? Jim can sing something, maybe. I actually like what Jim did. You like that one? Yeah. <laughs> next up on our uh, list of topics. Uh, something that I think is kind of interesting, I wanted to, to see what you guys thought about it, is uh, Amazon is going to be offering digital prints to libraries, okay? Digital versions of books to libraries. Now, uh, in a statement provided to Publishers Weekly, an Amazon spokesperson confirmed that Amazon Publishing 
is in active discussions with the Digital Public Library of America, and the company expects to begin testing a number of different models in early 2021. Quote, we believe libraries serve a critical purpose in the communities across the country, and our priority is to make Amazon publishing eBooks available in a way that ensures a viable model for authors as well as library patrons. All right, so the, the, the so what of this a little further down is that these books are not anyone who's publishing through Amazon. They are Amazon published books. So Thomas and Mercer, uh, you know, uh, what is it? 41 North or, or something like that, uh, that they had. Um, and so Amazon is doing that. The, the interesting part I thought was all titles under the potential deal would be licensed as EPUB editions managed by the digital uh, public library of America and its partner libraries and made accessible to patrons via the Simply E app, which is an open free source library reader, uh, meaning that library users will not have to go through Amazon to access the titles. So my question is, is this a, is this a good thing for all authors, not just Thomas and Mercer? Uh, can this be a good thing for everyone down the line? And if so, so uh, how do you think it would be, uh, Pippa? Um, well, my first question is actually, uh, I've found there to be very different standards for any ebooks or audiobooks in terms of library lending, or at least there used to be right at the start um, than there are with paper books. And so they had a very strict limit on how many times you could lend out an ebook mm. compared to a paper book where there just weren't any limits on that. You, you were saying. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, and, I think I'm, a, I'm aware. Of, yeah, I think I'm aware of what you were saying. Yeah. And so, if it solves oh, that ahead, problem, sorry, I think it's um, it's very good. I, you know, I, I've never expected a library to be a money maker. I think of a library as being there as a public service, and it's you know great if people can discover books. You know, some of my favorite memories are browsing through libraries and just picking up titles that looked interesting, and so having a wealth of knowledge there for people to be able to access, even if they can't physically get to a, a library, that's great. Especially if it uh, inspires the trad publishers to be following suit. And if it allows, it paves the way for other authors to get in there as well. So I'm in favor, warily in favor, but in favor. Right on. <laughs> right, on. <Sounds> good. <laughs> right on. And so I guess uh, my question is, uh, uh, maybe I'll ask, I'll ask Jim this. Because Nick looks like he's hard at work on the on the soundboard over there prepping something. I'm waiting um, for somebody to mess up so I can give him the sound. If you <laughs> if you if they gave you the chance to put your books in the libraries, Jim, uh, would you go for it or no? Uh, yeah, I would. And what's interesting is I I have a book with an Amazon publisher. I have a book published by Kindle Press, and they haven't said anything to me about whether or not that's going into a library. Um, I don't know. Um, but. I, in general, I, I, I'm in favor of my books being in libraries because I don't think that if somebody checks out my book from a library, I wouldn't consider that a lost sale because people checking out books from libraries probably don't buy a whole lot of books anyway. Uh, that's like why I don't worry about art copies. Uh, you know, I don't I'll give out as many art copies as people want because I don't you know, those art people, they weren't going to buy it anyway, probably. Um, so I'm in. Yeah, I'd be in favor of having my catalog in a library. I don't see anything wrong with that. Right on. Uh, do uh, you concur with your esteemed colleagues, uh, Nick Thacker? Um, generally, I, I mean, if the question is, you know, would we rather have our books in libraries than not? I would say sure. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it all comes down to the contract. It all comes down to what the exchange is. Um, I'm totally with, um, with Philip there about, about it being a public service. I love libraries. I would never have found as a childhood um, or a childhood favorite author, um, Gary Paulson, you know, the Hatchet series. In, in the library uh, when I was just a kid. And so that kind of stuff, I think, needs the legacy that needs to continue. Now, this it's also a business. Um, libraries obviously have to buy books. And for some stupid reason, they're forced to charge crazy prices um, to, to purchase hardcover and, and paperback versions to stock their libraries. And a lot of libraries can't afford that. They have a, a, obviously a limited budget, a finite budget. And so they end up buying um, a few of the, the main hardcover releases um, each month or whatever. Um, and I'm not obviously getting into in very specific terms, but the point is ebooks allow 
libraries, theoretically, to purchase an almost unlimited amount of books. So the discoverability for an author can, can go way up, uh, the possible potential for discoverability. Um, to me, any indie author, or I should say any author, um, is, is publishing for one or a combination of three reasons. And the first one doesn't matter. That's posterity. You just publish it for yourself. But the two that are important to us as indie authors are discoverability and sales. Um, and, and for me personally, my opinion is at, at first, you know, we, we should focus only on the first part, only on getting our name out there. Um, give away your book as much as possible. That's where getting into a library at all costs is, is wise, in my opinion, and why this would be good for authors. Um, but at some point in our career, and this is kind of where I am, um, it switches from not just worrying about getting your name out there, but, well, now I'm doing this full time. This is my job. So how do I put food on the table? So that caveat for me is, well, sure, I'd love for my books to be in a library, but I do want to look at that contract a little harder and figure out how are they going to pay authors for this? Um, is it is it just if the book is read? In that case, that's fine. It doesn't cost anything. Put it out there and, and see if people will, will read it. But anyway, what's the... What's the mm. bottom line, I guess, is my question. And I, it looks like that's, that's, yeah. You know, and so, and you know, know what Amazon's going to do, right? Sure. Yeah. By the time they trickle it to people who aren't on an imprint, uh, who knows what they'll be trying to do. Um, now, just as an aside, if you aren't exclusive with KU, you could get into libraries via something like overdrive or something. Is that right? Without Amazon's mm. help at the moment. Correct. Yeah, you used to be able to. I can't remember. I did back when the print publishing was through the Amazon group. That was how I got print copies in. But I don't know about e-copies. I don't know if you can donate them the same way that you can donate a paperback. Yeah, I I know there's a couple libraries in um, Colorado Springs where I used to live that have my copy of the Enigma Strain, which the um, ebook version is exclusive to Amazon. And I didn't do that. I don't know how that happened. Um, hmm. But there are also hmm. a couple paperback copies floating around. I also didn't do that. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure there's people that bought well, it, it and hated it and donated it to the library. But that's yeah. kind of my well, opinion. Amazon, if you're listening, earmuffs, okay, his, his uh, content <laughs> is not out there and it's not an exclusive deal. So you guys just put on your earmuffs, uh, Amazon. <laughs> All right. So I have a, another story. And this is. Uh, I would say it's more trad uh, centric, but to be honest, I'm kind of agnostic about how you sell books. You know, um, I, I would get my books out there however I can. And so this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, it's the, the, the merging of Penguin Random House and Simon and Schuster. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are two massive, the number one and the number three uh, book publishers uh, are merging together. Okay. And it says that uh, despite uh, that, that let me make sure I get this right. Random House is sucking up Simon and Schuster, and that uh, Viacom CBS agreed to sell Simon and Schuster to Random House for more than two billion dollars uh, in a deal that'll create the first mega publisher. Which I think is interesting because, in in the scope of things, I. I know that Disney bought Marvel and Star Wars both for, for $4 billion each. So all of Simon and & Schuster and all their properties is worth $2 billion. That, that was kind of interesting to me. Um, so my question is, the, this mega publisher will be putting out the about 33% of all new books will come out through this mega publisher. Okay, And it's kind of hinted in this article, uh, which we'll have the link to, that this is... Uh, in reference to them trying to take on Amazon, who has uh, the lion's share, uh, which is sells about 49% of all new books. So my question is, do you guys believe that uh, this will help old school traditional publishers get with the times at all, or maybe stave off uh, going bankrupt as it kind of seems like they are? Jim, what do you think about that? You made a face... <laughs> well, I was just I was just thinking about what was it five years ago when there was the Amazon Hachette War <laughs> or five years ago. And I mean, who won that? Amazon, right? I mean, ha I think I think Amazon relented and let Hachette set the prices on some books. But, you know, I, I don't think that the book industry can take on Amazon. I don't think that probably most of the world governments put together can take on Amazon. Um, 
So I, uh, I think that um, I totally just lost my fucking train of thought. What was I talking about? Taking on okay, uh, seven shoots. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> when when penguin uh, uh, penguin merged with Random House three or four years ago, whatever happened then is whatever's going to happen now. Um, it's there's nothing in this is going to be good for authors. <laughs> but it's not necessarily bad for authors either. It's probably just going to be the same. Really what's different here is who's making the money at the top. Authors are still going to keep writing. They're either going to self-publish or they're going to try to join the traditional publishing lottery. And none of that's going to change. Yeah. I'm beginning to wonder if, uh, you know, Ari, you mentioned, is it going to help them get with the times? And I'm, really beginning to wonder if self-publishing and trad publishing are just serving completely different markets. And it's not that one needs to behave more like the other. There's one correct way. Um, And as long as people keep, well, traditional publishing relies on good authors continuing to submit their work. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Um, And if this is one of those things that causes people to stop submitting their work at a certain point, there'll be, there'll be downstream implications, but um, I, like Jim said, I don't expect there to be many changes on the publishing front because they've shown over the last few years that they're not willing to make very many changes. The only changes they're willing to make are locking down and passing less along to the authors <laughs> and <laughs> squeezing the mid list out. Yeah. So, yeah. What about, what about Nick? Got anything to add to that? Uh, that's all good stuff. I the only thing I, I would like to add is um, I don't know that we understand. I don't think we anyone can know the reason for the actual merger um, from a oh, how should I say this? Um, <laughs> well, no, I just I mean there's nothing bad here. It's just you know mergers happen all the time. Um, it's usually because one company is not doing as well as they want to, or um, mm-hmm. the company acquiring them may not be doing as well, but they have cash, you know, whatever. The point is, it's all money. Um, it has nothing to do with quality of books um, and, and the way they want to treat authors in the future. So I'm with Jim. I don't think anything's going to change on that front. But I do know that there's really not um, not not much less they can do for authors, meaning <laughs> they're still going to pay a pittance, but it's not going to be <laughs> any less than it was before. So that tells me that the equation, the status quo is changing. And that tells me, my opinion anyway, and I, I'm sure there's a way to track this, but I don't have the numbers. Whatever um, those two companies were public, the number of books those two companies were publishing before um, in competition with each other will go down now because some of the competition has just gone away. So that makes it that much more competitive for the authors trying to publish through the new super merged company. Um, does that make sense? So I, in my opinion, um, I don't think this new company is going to go, now we own this other company. Let's publish more books this year. Sure. I think they're going to publish less because they can do more with less now. They're going to double down on the authors that are selling really well. Um, they're going to double down on the few um, acquisitions they know are going to be, you know, they know, I'm quoting air quotes here, are going to be a success. Um, and then all the other mid-list authors can go, you know, whatever. Um, and so I think long term, uh, maybe even midterm, that means we're going to get even more traditionally published or traditionally focused authors moving toward a hybrid or indie model. Now, mm. that's all pure speculation. But just hearing the little that you know what you guys have talked about, um, this is business and this is America and capitalism. I don't see the company going, hey, well, we've all done this because it's for the love of the books. Let's just publish more and more and more. They're going to say, well, great. Now we don't have those guys to compete with, so we're not going to have to publish um, a documentary that matches the documentary book that that pub- company published. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. that's that's my only take. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah, Here's no, my- no. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Jim. I think of one thought. I don't. I don't care what traditional publishing does as long as they keep pricing their books at ten bucks, twelve bucks, fourteen bucks. <laughs> when they figure out that they can sell more books if they price them at four ninety nine, <laughs> then I'll be worried about what traditional publishing <laughs> is doing. But yeah, till then different people are buying my books versus the ones that are paying $16 for a thriller. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. I just had a conversation with a, a new thriller author. He's an a, incredible sci-fi author, just getting into the thriller um, specific market. And he asked me last night, Hey, should I, excuse me, should I launch my first book in the thriller market at 99 cents or four ninety nine? And I immediately came back with six ninety nine. 
Um, I just launched a book two days ago um, for six ninety nine. Just like I've launched every other book in that series for six ninety nine. I do sales, so those numbers go down every now and then, or the price goes down every now and then. But the whole point is, when I got into this, I didn't know anything about the indie world. All I knew was the authors that I read in my genre that were traditionally published. Their damn eBooks were fourteen ninety nine. Um, and their paperback versions were twelve ninety nine because those publishing companies aren't in the business of selling books; they're in the business of printing dead trees. Um, and so, I, I thought, I, well, hey, I want to compete with those authors. So if I can pitch my book or position my book so it looks like a really discounted version of the same books those readers are familiar with, um, I, I can win. And it's worked for me. I've developed a readership that. Um, of course, reads a lot of indie authors as well, but initially they read James Rollins and Clive Cussler and Dan Brown and the guys that I'm, I'm in that market with. So they're still way better at it than I am, but I'm trying to write books in that vein for that reason because, yeah, I'm, I'm able to compete at a higher price point than most indie <coughs> So in, long story short, yeah. Jim, um, price those books at 100 bucks because then mine look like they're on sale and like, we can all raise our prices. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well done. Well done. All right. So there was a, a interesting little uh, little kind of thing that we had going on this week. Uh, you know, if you guys are anything like me, you're probably always trying to check and see how much money your books are making every day. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of great avenues to do that. There are a few there. You know, you could pay for something like reader links or a book report. Um, or you can use the KDP page uh, dashboard, which is free, but has kind of undergone a lot of weirdness and it, it looks strange and it defaulting to like the line graph instead of the bar graph. And I don't even understand what's happening anymore. Um, and so I say that to say that uh, if you're wide, Google Play, uh, they have a new analytics page. Uh, they sent out an email to people who have their books on Google play uh, basically saying that, you know, the new functionality allows you to view and analyze your sales data by units sold or earnings. You can filter your sales data by title, book format, country, and custom date ranges. And they're added new charts displaying the top selling average sales price and top uh, geographies. So I think that maybe uh, that's a good thing. Maybe uh, KDB could kind of get with the times and cause I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a, a huge fan of their reporting. Uh, what do you do uh, for your reporting, Pippa? Do you just use KDP or do you pay for something? Um, this is an interesting question. When is this episode airing? <laughs> this I actually practice. Play, play the breaking news break. <laughs> play the breaking news break, dude. Um, breaking news. Because uh, there's going to be something in the next couple of weeks that will address these concerns. <laughs> That is all I can say. <laughs> so, um, and that is what I will be using. And I will be happy to talk about it more awesome. when we, uh, um, but that will be working for wide. I'm currently in the process of taking everything out of wide. I was using book report. It, um, I used to really like to take my reports and do my own analysis on them from KDP, but they aren't formatted in a way that makes that very easy. And so, um, I love the analytics page because it allows me to filter things in a new way. What I would love from different places and platforms is the ability to export data in a format that could be easily run through um, SQL and reporting and, and all sorts of stuff like that. But I don't think that's ever going to be demanded enough that they'll do that. Um, however, yes, in a couple of weeks, I will have more details for you on the other thing. And we will be sure <laughs> to talk to you about that then. <laughs> Jim, Jim, what do you do to, to get your uh, how much money am I making fix? <laughs> well, I'm I'm exclusive to Amazon uh, for almost everything. And so I, I use Book Report and I pay for it. And I tried to stop paying for Book Report when the KDP dash uh, KDP mm -hmm. beta thing came out. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, great. There's 20 bucks a month. I don't have to spend on Book Report. But K K the KDP dashboard beta is still not there yet. And uh, book report just makes it clean and easy to understand and just gives me the stuff that I care about and it's very configurable. So I haven't looked at KDP reports in quite a while, actually, not since I tried that beta and said, that's eh, not quite there yet. I dig it. I dig it. What about you, uh, FACA? 
Same thing. Um, I use Book Report. Uh, pretty simple because I'm an idiot. And if it gets more complicated than uh, idiot level, then I'm out. Um, you know, I had high hopes for the KDP beta as well, but you know. Well, what do you think? What do you think they would need to do to make the KDP beta a little more uh, exciting for you? Oh, I don't know. Date filtering for one, like being able to choose. I mean, you no, know, there's just they, they just I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. They focused on making part of it look really pretty and then part of it being so ar- arcane and, and indecipherable that I just ran back to book report and said, take my money. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I'm with you on that one. All right. Sounds like we're all in agreement. OK, so every week we're going to try to wrap this show up and maybe get away from. Uh, the masochistic world that we're living in with everyone beating us down with the reports and the analytics and the mergers. So I got to ask you guys, who's got something good to tell me? Cause I need some good news in my life. I have 2020 some... will be over soon. That was, that was my, <laughs> no, sorry. Amen. <laughs> Amen, sister. Amen. Amen. Like Amen. the whole thing I've got. <laughs> 2020 not good. I, I miss uh, once you guys as, as, you as Nick lives in paradise, some of these things <laughs> miss him. Yeah, I don't know. I had an amazing year. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if the best we can do in 2020 is going to be over soon, then I think I think that'll be awesome. That'll be awesome. <laughs> All right. We are going to say goodbye for this first and inaugural uh, podcast. So uh, if you have anything that you want us to tell us, you want to tell us about, you can email uh, ideals for stories or things you want us to discuss to a n w tips at gmail.com. That's alpha November whiskey tips at gmail.com. Send us in uh, your hot tips or anything you want us to talk about. And we will give you uh, credit on the show for asking and we will uh, talk our way through it. So, uh, for all of us at ANW, I'm going to say if you got to listen to one podcast all week, you should probably make it this one because uh, it's pretty awesome. So see you next time. <laughs>